Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Hello, listeners. We are really excited to invite you to a live podcast recording to celebrate the publication of our new book, Dreamwise, Unlocking the Meaning of Your Dreams. The event will be held on November 17th at 1 p.m. Eastern, and there's going to be a lot of fun stuff. We'll let our hair down with you. You can laugh along with us as we roll with bloopers in front of the live cameras. And a lucky few of you will walk away with a dream alchemist toolkit. We really want you to join us in this mission of awakening people to their inner wisdom. And, and when you think of buying your copy of DreamWise, think about the people you could share that with and introduce them to a similar moment when you realize what your dreams really could mean. At the live event, we're going to be interpreting a lot of your dreams. It'll be kind of like a dream-a-thon. We're going to ask that you submit your dreams at the event. So come prepared. We'll be sharing a link and then we'll be interpreting those dreams as we get them. So we hope you'll join us. Tickets are in the link and we'll see you on the 17th. Today we're going to talk about cultural complexes and how they contribute to the current political landscape. Large groups can often function as a single psyche with identifiable patterns of feeling, thinking, and acting based on an aggregate of collective experiences organized around an archetypal core, just as we are as individuals. To explore this, we're joined by Thomas Singer, who is a psychiatrist and Jungian psychoanalyst. He contributed to the New York Times bestseller, The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump. In addition, he is the author and editor of many works, including a series of books on cultural complexes. He serves on the board of the Archive for Research into Archetypal Symbolism and has been the co-editor of that organization's many publications. And you may remember him from our previous episode on archetypal images. Mm. Today we're going to focus on Mind of State, conversations on the psychological conflicts stirring U.S. politics and Society, a published collection of insightful conversations exploring the intersection of psychology and politics amidst the overwhelming flood of daily news and cultural conflicts, and it aims to unravel complex psychological underpinnings of political issues, particularly how they influence societal behavior, emotions, and decision-making. And it's great to see you again, Tom. Well, thank you for that uh, very, very fine introduction. It makes me cringe a little bit. It's so much, but, <laughs> um, but I'm really glad to, to join you again uh, for this Im hopefully important and meaningful conversation. Yeah. Well, it's a new perspective. We don't normally talk about the culture as a single psychological entity. And, and we don't often talk about the psychology of our political beliefs. Uh, there get, it's like we're talking about something that's out there, and uh, our opinions and convictions are fact about the external world versus how does that tie in with my psychology, my values, and my mythology? about how things should be. So, yes, Tom, well, yeah, go ahead. Tom, I was going to have you just jump in because yeah. many of us are brand new to this. Mm -hmm. So let's start with some <laughs> basics. Yeah. What is a cultural complex? Like, what is that thing, that unicorn that many of us haven't seen before? Well, 
of course, you and, and your audience are familiar with Jung's notion of complexes, uh, which is uh, one of the most central contributions that Jung made to the study of psychology, really at the beginning of the 20th century. And, um, uh, and we're familiar with it in terms of how complexes uh, live inside of us as individuals. And so we're familiar with terms like mother complex or father complex or power complex or inferiority complex. These, this is a language that's worked its way into everyday use, and it's based on Jung's notion of the complex, which was a, a very elaborate, uh, at the same time somewhat simple, and I mean that in a positive way, notion of aggregates of emotion and ideas and memories and images that collect around a specific theme in the psyche. We're used to it in terms of personal complexes, but in fact the same thing can happen in large groups or even small groups of people where the group develops a complex around specific issues. Some of the complex are highly specific to rather small groups, but there are cultural complexes which are uh, very widespread and which influence deeply how people think and feel. And Deb, as you suggest, they live inside of us. We're unaware that they're indwelling because we uh, take them to be such a given that we don't differentiate between inner and outer. But cultural complexes like personal complexes are uh, living psychological uh, aggregates of experience that are very powerful in their influence on our thinking and our behavior. And for the most part, we're not aware of it. The unconsciousness of a complex, whether it be personal or cultural, is one of the identifying qualities, that we're unaware that we're so moved by such a deep force. And you, you identify areas in which uh, we have complexes. It's just part of our cultural landscape uh, that we're going to have complexes around gender, ethnicity, race. Uh, how we feel about the natural environment, our relationship to the human community. It could be our own family, it could be our town, it could be uh, the whole life cycle in general. Uh, our relationship to truth and free speech or limitations on that. And our relationship to the world uh, at large, all those you know, countries all around the world. So that's those are part of our parts of our landscape, and we have complexes around them. We have ways that we organize our thinking and feeling about uh, what's good or worthwhile or important or right that we often don't reflect on. Absolutely, and and in fact, when you say that we organize our experience around, we actually don't organize our experience. Uh. Right. It's organized for us by the culture, and we simply partake of that. We're born into it. And it, as Jung said about personal complexes, which is also true of cultural complexes, they're not, um, they're, they're naturally occurring phenomena. They're, they're not some strange, pathological, abnormal beast. Complexes are naturally occurring psychological phenomena that are a shared part of the human experience. It's part of who we are. So it's part of the underpinnings of civilization, really, to have any shared view or experience or an agreement, um, whether it's uh, unconscious or conscious, of behavior and values and all of that. Absolutely. Without, without that, I think we might not even have a civilization. Yes, that's, that's right. I like that use of the word foundation because I think it's absolutely true. Sometimes when I get sort of uh, imaginatively speculative, I, I make the analogy to an amphibian that crawls out of the sea and is able to survive on land because unlike fish and other water creatures, they've developed the, a primitive kidney so that they can filter an internal environment and maintain it while on land and out of the sea. 
And I think of complexes as being sort of like our psychic <laughs> kidneys. That we're, that's, that's how we survive. We have a filtering mechanism that helps us adapt to the world through a set of attitudes and expectations, many of which are unconscious and some of which can be quite destructive. Uh, and so, uh, so just, just to let you know, I, this is a study I've been conducting for over two decades, and I'm going to hold up a, a, a great big series of Oh, my books. goodness. These, wow. these are all studies of cultural complexes in different parts of the world by Jungian colleagues. I think there's some 90 different colleagues from around the world, from Latin America, from Australia, from Southeast Asia, from Europe, from North America, who have helped create this field of study about cultural complexes. Because cultural complexes, what makes them so interesting is they're specific to a time and a place and a region. And that's a very important point, that, they're, that they have high specificities to specific cultures. And, uh, and so uh, it's important because, because we have this notion of archetypes, which is sort of these universal, shared, common symbols around the world. And as Jungians, we tend to rather quickly go to archetypal explanations of cultural and other phenomena. So we'll talk about the shadow or the anima and the feminine as if we all agree on what we mean and as if it's common around the world. And of course, there are high, high variations of, around the experience of these archetypes through our cultural experience. And that's one of the things a complex does. Right. And and they're loaded with, uh, with emotion, and the emotion comes up, boom, automatically. Uh, as you said, we don't create the emotion. It, the unconscious, our bodies, it happens to us and arises in us. I'm going to uh, use a little down-to-earth example uh, you know, from way, way back when. The first time I uh, ever went to Europe, and I was in Ireland, and I, this was so long ago, and I went into uh, walking around, and we were going into some of the churches, and I happened to have on a top that was sleeveless. Now, th this is not, you know, was nothing terribly revealing or close-fitting or anything, just a sleeveless top in the middle of the summer. And several women gave me a little poke and a disapproving glance because my arms were not covered. I did not know at first what, what have I done wrong. I was not dressed appropriately and modestly. And then we can take an opposite example of cultures in which women are veiled, uh, fully garbed, and how do we feel about that when we, when we see that, especially if we see a fully veiled woman uh, on the streets of, of a major city or something where this is not the norm in our culture, and a feeling comes up of, of this, is, this is wrong, or what is that, or surprise, we're jolted. And that we're just talking about attire, but that can generate very strong feelings. As we know, there are cultural rules about how people should dress. Absolutely. And I think when you point to emotion as a central feature of cultural complexes, that, that's something that I feel very strongly about. I, I call a, emotional reactivity is the calling card of a cultural complex. If you want to know whether you're in the presence of a cultural complex or not, the power of the almost automatic reactivity of the emotion clues you into the fact that you've triggered a complex, whether it's through your dress or how somebody yes. else dresses, but it's, that, it's the trigger to the emotion that really puts you, it, it knows, puts you, uh, lets you know that you're in the realm of a cultural complex. And let me, let me just, let me just elaborate on that quality a bit more because I'm, I'm, I'm sort of a strickler when it comes to cultural complexes in trying to be 
specific about the defining characteristics. And so let me, let me give a list of the defining characteristics of cultural complexes, which would allow you to differentiate whether or not you're in the presence of a, an activated cultural complex. Mm -hmm. Of course, the first quality would be that emotional reactivity. The second quality would be what we Jungians call the autonomous nature of it. Autonomous meaning that it has a life of its own. We don't think about it for it to exist, and in fact, we didn't create it. It's, I liken it to the, the so-called vegetative uh, neurological system. We don't think about breathing. We don't think about our heart rate. We don't think about digestive juices. All of these things take place at the ve so-called vegetative level of our nervous system, and they occur automatically, and they're part of being alive. The same is true of complexes, cultural complexes. Uh, at the psychological level, they're autonomous, they have a life of their own, and they function often without our awareness. So the unconsciousness of them, the autonomy of them, Another quality would be the kind of thinking that tends to go along with a cultural complex. Cultural complexes tend to be quite black and white in their thinking. Cultural complexes don't like shades of gray and subtle complexity. Cultural complexes don't like complexity. They like simplicity and black and white thinking. Uh, those are some of the characteristics, yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um... And it, it, it's interesting how quickly and easily we can go to that kind of polarization. That if, I, if something comes up in me and I have that emotional reactivity, I feel startled or something and I'm just taken aback, then that, and that happened in me, but I didn't do it, it was autonomous, then I'm very likely to make a snap decision which goes along the lines of, this isn't good, um, it, or it's bad, because I've reacted um, in a way that was maybe alarmed or startled, uh, and, and I go to a self-protective place, and then my thinking is, this must be wrong. Yes, it's a, they're very complexes, cultural complexes like personal complexes are very judgmental and righteous mm -hmm. in their attitudes to things. Another quality right. I want to add, because it's very important when you're talking about groups of people as opposed to individuals, the, the memory of cultural complexes, the quality of memory is highly selective. And so cultural complexes tend to remember the experiences that are most important to the complex, rather than to what we might think of as objective memory. It's the memory of a complex is highly selective, so that right now, if you're in, an Israeli uh, remembering October 7th of a year ago, your memory of uh, Hamas and Palestinians is going to be so strongly influenced emotionally by that traumatic event, that the memory becomes quite selective. It's the only thing you can remember or think about. So that quality of selective memory is an important characteristic of a cultural complex. Just as, yeah. So this is something that I, I've been talking a lot about to my analysands, is that the, the amount of intensity that people will feel about events from the past, for instance, that they never experienced, maybe even happened before their lifetime, that their nervous systems respond as if it's a current reality. And it takes up so much internal real estate. Um, that is so complicated <laughs> to be able to help people differentiate from that. Um, I think that's a really good point, and it, and it brings to mind something I've often said about cultural complexes. Uh, I'm looking forward to the day when we can go into this, the, uh, the, neuro, the laboratory of a neuroscientist and study the link between memory and emotion and thinking and 
and how they're all interconnected so that when you touch a personal complex or a cultural complex, you're getting the linkage of, of the memory. You may get an image. You're going to get a thought. You're going to have a strong feeling. And as you said, it, it, it fires off in such a way that it takes up the whole psyche, all of the real estate. There's nothing else. It obliterates everything else. Exactly. And in that way, we've lost so much of our capacity to choose and be creative. So much of our own personality is diminished into a kind of two-dimensional place. Tom, I'm wondering, um, would you like to choose one cultural complex that we can then trace through a process? Um, talk about how it, maybe it was formed, what might be a central archetype. Is there one that you might just put on the well, table? Well, there's for us? one that I, I recently wrote about which caught my attention because it was so uh, stunning in the attention that it drew to itself and the layers of meaning that uh, almost instantaneously accrued to it, which was the comment that was attributed to J.D. Vance from 1920 or 21, excuse me, 2021, I'm only a century off, 2021, <laughs> and com cultural complexes are long-lived, and this is one that goes <laughs> further back than that. But um, when he referred to the childless cat ladies, ah. Oh which became, some people call it a meme, but it became a very potent trigger in the collective psyche and got a lot of energy for very interesting reasons. Uh, the, the reference was to the danger of uh, politicians. The reference was to politicians, men and women, because it was Pete, Pete Buttigieg, Buttigieg, I never get it right, Pete Buttigieg and, and, and uh, Kamala Harris. Adults who haven't had children as not being necessarily the best equipped to lead our country because they don't have that experience of being childbearing. So the reference was to childless cat ladies. And um, this is a, a, a perfect example of a cultural right. complex which has deep historical roots, uh, thanks to an Italian colleague who had done some research on cats through Eris. There's a very interesting history of cats and witches that goes back to the Middle Ages. And cats were actually considered uh, the, uh, a form that witches took. And there were papal decrees in which it was uh, mandated that the witches and their cats be burned together because they could turn into one another. And in fact, it was reputed that the witches had an extra, an extra nipple for nurturing their cats. And uh, so, so there was a whole history of the link between cats and witches, which of course brings up terribly negative associations about women who are seen as outside and doing all these off, uh, casting spells on people so that, so that the illusion immediately without talking about witches went to the the middle the medieval ages notion of witches and cats as being interchangeable and being associated directly with the devil then if you go to another level which is the egyptian level of the cat they love the cat they worship the cat as an ideal of sort of the feminine embodiment of uh, creativity and protection and nurture so that there are layers of meaning about cats. And so when you say childless cat lady, which it's not innocuous, but it certainly doesn't seem to be as potent as it is when you begin to look in and un into it and unravel the layers of meaning and the deep historical layers of meaning and feeling negative and positive associated with the cat and women and witches. And so childless cat lady becomes a very potent contemporary mean for a cultural complex that has all sorts of suggested meanings about a person who happens, a woman who happens to be childless. Yeah. So it's like that phrase conjured. 
Uh all of this deep archaic material that we believe exists in a shared collective bank, so to speak. I doubt if uh, J.D. Vance was thinking at that level. Oh, I'm sure he wasn't. (laughs) I don't think so. But to your point, that's fantastic, Tom. Well, I don't know whether he was thinking that way. I, I'm inclined to think that he wasn't thinking of medieval witches and, <laughs> and or Egyptian uh, uh, goddesses. Uh, but it's layered into the association to the image yes. of childless cat lady. So right. it, it resonates. That's what a cultural complex does. It resonates and brings up deep feeling. Often people don't know where the feeling comes from, but it's very powerful. Right. No, it's. It's such a great example of showing uh, what I think of as a deep tap root uh, in our psyches as individuals and as collectives. That the J.D. Vance grabs hold of this little meme, but it has a tap root that goes way, way, way down, and that's why it caught hold. That's why it's resonated. That's why it reverberated is because it has this archetypal power of which most of us are unconscious, unconscious. Until, until we lift it up and, and really think about it. But that resonance to witches who were, you know, cold, unfeeling, not nurturing, dangerous, you know, any of the, all those other characteristics are now, that, that's why... Uh, and what childless cat ladies are is a dangerous, unfeeling, unsuited for leadership, just like Kamala Harris. Yes, that's right. It's, it's very dangerous. The witch-like quality is that it's evil, too. It's associated, actually, oh. with the devil. That's why when, when Taylor Swift picked up on it in her remarkable endorsement of Kamala Harris, she signed it, childless cat lady. Yeah. And so she's... So that's how a cultural complex works its way into the political discourse and moves people and causes uh, all sorts of powerful emotion on many sides of the equation when it comes to the feelings about women as leaders, the feelings about women as mothers, the feelings about women as being aggressive, the feelings of women as childbearing. And of course, all of this is particularly potent at a time when Roe versus Wade was uh, undone, and uh, and there's a tremendous conflict about abortion and women's rights to make choices about their own body. So it layers right into that enormously already highly conflicted, highly charged emotional uh, discourse would be too too nice a word for it. It's not a discourse. It's a fight. It's a food fight. And it, it evokes this spirit of suspicion, that women are suspicious. Old women, women in the woods, women that want to have abortions, that, that they have to be legislated, because if you leave those suspicious women to themselves, what might they do to their fetuses? Yes. Which goes to the old blood libel uh, yeah. stuff in medieval Europe as well. So that mood of a dangerous, suspicious association with evil and trickster, all coming forward with the idea, like you said, of the childless cat ladies. So these emergences seem to happen spontaneously, but when they have a taproot down, 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 then all of a sudden we can know that because the idea catches the attention of the collective, and then we start seeing it echoed like you said, in memes, even if it's jokes or cultural reappropriation of it. But it takes a life of its own, which speaks to the idea of the autonomy. Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, we've been talking about this, but I'll make it more explicit, that there is a fear of women and power uh, uh, that goes to you know medieval witches, and millions of women were killed in in Europe, and of course the Salem witch trials in the U.S. Of there is something about the power of woman uh, that that is so deep seated uh, that we often don't articulate it or understand it, and in 
this country, in today's world, when women can choose to be childless. Uh, you know, thanks to the famous, quote, pill, unquote, uh, there is a deep-seated ambivalence about the power of the feminine. I'm not talking just about gender, but uh, about feminine and feminine power that is now no longer just under the control of patriarchal power and, and rules. And good God, what will happen if we let that loose in the world? Yeah, it's, it's, it's very uh, striking right now uh, how powerful this movement is among women and many men as well mm -hmm. who are truly ready for a different understanding about women and their power and their mm -hmm. legitimate authority. Yeah. And it's, in a way, challenging a cultural complex of the so-called patriarchy. Yeah. I'm not a big fan of the word patriarchy because it gets, there's some positive things about the patriarchy, but the negative aspects of the patriarchy, which have really held sway for two or 3,000 years or more, ever since the monotheistic religions established themselves, so that if you want to talk about a cultural complex and the fear, repression, and subjugation of women, that's a very old culture, old archetype with layers in, in different cultures and expressions in different cultures. Weddings waft us into the mythic realm of sacred union and innate human longing for harmonious completion. If you've had a dream featuring a wedding or a wedding symbol, like exchanging rings or a special white gown, Please send us your most memorable dreams, and when you do, you'll be entered into a draw to win a free copy of our new book, DreamWise, Unlocking the Meaning of Your Dreams. So I think we're leaning into an important piece that cultural complexes can often be linked to trauma and historical events. And there is a way in which trauma, as it does for the individual, it takes hold of our psyches, it interrupts the normal way that our ego might link to the outer world, it kind of injects itself or injects a narrative into the psychic structure and then diverts energy over to the side. So would you say, Tom, that cultural complexes for the most part are often linked to trauma in some way? I think many cultural complexes do have their origins in traumatic experiences of specific or individual groups, whether they be the Holocaust of the Jews or slavery for the black people or what the Chinese Americans experienced when they first came over to the United States and worked on the railroads. Uh, so I do think that Trauma is intimately linked to cultural complexes, but I would say that it's not exclusive. That I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that all cultural complexes have origins in trauma. And the, the contrary example I would give would be the notion of progress. Now, progress is a very powerful idea in the American psyche. It's one of the most powerful ideas we have. We, we've had because of this enormous frontier and tremendous opportunity and the industrial revolution and the technological revolution and, uh, and uh, increases in lifespan and in comfort, we, we've come to believe that progress is inevitable and that it's our, almost our God-given given right that we will progress uh, endlessly and linearly. Well. It so happens that's a cultural complex. It grows out of a deep experience of prosperity and well-being, not out of trauma, out of enormous success. But then it becomes a one-sided idea about who we are as people. And any time our notions of progress are thwarted, we feel almost as if we've been betrayed by God or, or whoever it is. So that, so I, and I think consumerism is another kind of cultural complex 
in which our material success became so taken for granted that, that we become identified with our consumerism. And in my mind, that becomes a cultural complex. But I don't think it's based on trauma. I think it's based on prosperity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and a certain kind of entitlement uh, that this is how it should be. Uh, and also, I'm noticing that both of these things uh, really are very externally oriented. The progress, I will see the progress out there with uh, new inventions, uh, better roads, uh, more technology, uh, and same thing with consumerism. Uh, it's out there of the kinds of the kind of car I drive or the kind of neighborhood I live in or whether I get a promotion. Those are all things, they're all external world uh, indicators, markers. Uh, and so concrete, and I think about now what is going on in the internal world. How, how do do I ha am I making progress, quote unquote, um, in my psyche? Does it really depend upon the kind of car I can buy? Uh, how have we gotten hijacked uh, into this kind of cultural complex? Well, one of the things, just as an aside, that. I that I see particularly um, in young men around their 30s is the idea of self-optimization, that every aspect of either their inner or personal life has a progressive way of being optimized. And I think that speaks to this idea of progress and an ever-expanding positive potential without examining the downside of it. It kind of negates a lot of other things in favor to progress for progress's sake. So I think, Deb, it, there is a way in which it's bouncing around inside of people and bouncing around uh, in the outer environment. Of course, they play back and forth. Yeah, I, I, I think both those points are excellent because it, it leads to almost an evacuation of the inner life or an emptying of the inner life, uh, which is filled by all of these markers of material uh, success or optimization and an ever upward progress. And of course, our experience as human beings is that we fail. Uh, not everything works out. Sometimes our failures are our most important experiences. We learn from them and, and that's how we grow as human beings. And so these cultural complexes, and I say cultural because it's not just us individually, this, these are shared attitudes among large groups of people. And uh, I remember when, uh, after 9-11, uh, George Bush came out and, uh, I, you know, that terrible, uh, the trauma of the World Trade Center and the Pentagon and so on. And his first words to the American public were, shop, go shop. Um, <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. Gonna, let's go, sh go shop, which was a way of sort of affirming our, our positive spirit, which we could express through maintaining the economy and not losing faith, but it was go shop. Well, probably there would have been a better psychological response to the trauma of 9-11 than go shop. But again, he didn't choose that. It was as if the collective psyche chose him as, yeah. a, a, as a mouthpiece to, to echo back to itself. Absolutely. And when, and when we invaded Iraq after 9-11 uh, uh, after and all of that, that the, the war that he conducted, um, he, he, he had a slip in the, in, the, in the press room. He said, this new crusades. Well, it, he was linking it back to the Christian invasion of, of the Middle East. That was not a conscious slip, I don't think. It was the historical link of what 9-11 meant in terms of the Arab, Christian, uh, Muslim worlds, a very old cultural complex, reactivated. And that goes back to what you were saying before, Tom, about how a complex is black or white. We get righteous. We get judgmental. 
um, the Crusades were, you know, we're right. Uh, we're liberating, you know, uh, infidels. Um, it's very uh, polarized when we go on a crusade. Well, we may be in a modern crusade because there are a lot of people, white Christians, who are afraid that our country is being overrun by a uh, immigrant, non-Christian immigrant class of people that are dangerous. And to preserve ourselves, we need to reaffirm our Christian nationhood. There's a whole Christian nationhood movement, which I think is based on fear of being replaced and displaced. But that would be an old cultural complex reaffirming itself in the, in, in the face of fear of danger. That would be a cultural complex, I think. And, and that's one of the things you mentioned is uh, the fear of other, whether other it's a racial or ethnic or religious difference that makes uh, some group uh, other. I think it's an accomplishment to be able to embrace the other. I think in some ways the most natural thing is to feel comfortable with your own kind, whatever that own kind is. Uh, if we're Jewish, if we're black, if we're Christian, if we're uh, uh, Asian, whatever, I'm doing these big categories. But I think the most natural thing is for people to link with, marry with, and identify with the people who are like them. I don't think that's unnatural. I think it's natural. And I think it's experienced as threatening to move outside of that. I think it goes against. Uh, I won't call it an instinct per se, but I think to be able to embrace and include the other is a developmental accomplishment. It's a huge accomplishment um, and one that is indicative, I think, of maturity. And not only is it a, an accomplishment as we uh, live you know, in the world uh, out there in a material way, but it's an accomplishment internally from a Jungian perspective of how do we recognize and work with our own shadows? In other words, do we have an internal democracy or do we have an authoritarian um, internal structure of rulership of things that are good, that are bad? Um, we just don't deal with our shadows. Uh, Etc. In in an attempt at at control and staving off what we fear might be chaos and just the wish to believe we're all really good people. So what I'm hearing Deb, there is that yes, in the individual psyche, but if we lean into what Tom is saying, that that same agenda could exist in a large group. Yes. Again, this idea of evac a group can evacuate their own shadow and then find other groups to reject that onto, that we're all participating it in a collective way. But it is more than an individual uh, thing, which is what makes it so powerful and also so sobering. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Don Kalshed, I'm sure you're familiar with Don's work, and maybe he's been on your show before. But yes. Don has, has written some lovely papers on this notion of the inner democracy versus kind of an inner totalitarianism. And I think from that introverted Jungian perspective, it's a, it's a wonderful contribution that he's made, very similar to the, to the point that you're making, Deb, that there's an inner reality to how these structures exist inside of us as individuals, and then also how they exist inside of us as groups. and. Uh, particularly in today's polariz polarizing world, we, it, for whatever reason, we're tending to get our identities through our political parties. They become more important, more and more important, in terms of our sense of who we are and who we aren't. It used to be that you could, you know, well, we, we might have all had political affiliations, but the intensity of identification with the different parties as 
being who we are. And it actually doesn't even matter what the policies are. If the policy flips 180 degrees over, the most important thing is to align with the party. It doesn't matter what the policy is. It's the identification with the party. It's a very dangerous phenomena because it, it, it stops us from thinking as individuals with our own ideas and perceptions. It, it, it creates a group think. And, and maybe that's the most scary thing about cultural complexes is that we fall subject to group think on both the Republican side and the Democratic side. We just fall into group think. And it's kind of terrifying, actually. It, it, it's it's mind numbing. And it's what uh, Christopher Hedges in, in 2008, he wrote a book, he called it the, uh, the Empire of Illusion, the End of Literacy and the Triumph of Spectacle. The Empire of Illusion, the End of Literacy and the Triumph of Spectacle. We, we've been reduced to these kinds of ways of thinking, and, and this is where the issue of truth becomes so important. Uh, the, the empire of illusion really means that what's real or true or untrue actually doesn't matter. What matters is how you spin your idea of what's important. And once we give up our fundamental notions of what's real and true, we're in great danger as a people. Yeah. So that uh, takes me to what are the standards for for thinking rather than picking up on memes and stuff on social media and you know all the diverse channels of information of you know what what are the standards for how we think about something where we go for our facts rather than uh, the triumph of, of spectacle, the triumph of a clever idea, the triumph of something that's exciting? Well, that's a, that's a great question. The first thought that comes to mind is that the first standard that is required for thinking is time. And because our experience of time has gotten so foreshortened in terms of our attention spans, in terms of our ability to listen and concentrate, listen to one another, exchange ideas. Maybe that's why podcasts have become so popular as kind of a compensation for the fact that our attention spans have become so limited. You can't think unless you have time and space to think. <laughs> that's, the, that's the very first criteria. And then you're lucky if you have a thought but, or an original thought. but, but um, Everything's so compressed, and, and it also creates a kind of eternal now in terms of the inf- We're always receiving some new information about a new storm or a new this or a new that, that we simply lurch from one event to the next, and we can't remember a month later what happened because it's so compressed and condensed. So I think uh, this is where I think we're suffering enormously from the so-called benefits of our technology uh, is that, that we're being, uh, our capacity to think is being foreshortened by the rapidity with which we're bombarded with information. Well, it seems also that technology, social media particularly, is enhancing that feeling of being a collective entity. It tricks us into thinking we're having an independent one-on-one conversation with our phone, but because that one-on-one conversation is also happening to one million other people, we're always being pulled into these experiences of a collective moment, a collective idea, a collective image. And I suppose that if we really take Jung's concept of the collective unconscious as a reality, there is, there is a certain resonant field that happens when large numbers of people are thinking the same thing, regarding the same image, that that alone creates a subtle field of an excessive amount of, or, or a loss of individual identity in that moment. 
And that's in that very non-rational layer. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I know, go ahead, Deb. Yeah, I'm thinking what an interesting point you're raising, Joseph, of that if you're alone in a room with your phone, it feels like I am having a, a personal private moment of interacting, learning, reading, absorbing something. But in reality, there are millions of people out there uh, being influenced. So we get seduced uh, into thinking that we're uh, doing something independently when, in fact, we're uh, being lured into a reality that someone else has created uh, and is shared by millions of people. Yes, I guess uh, extracting to the notion of a cultural complex, we could say that our evolving, almost daily evolving relationship to technology with AI emerging is itself a cultural complex, the implications of which we really don't know. It's the new frontier and how it's going to alter how we think, how we relate to ourselves, how we relate to others, how we relate to the world is going to be markedly, dramatically shifted in ways that we really don't understand. And that, that would be, a, a, it's a dangerous cultural complex, I think. I don't, I don't look forward to it. I, I agree. Uh, it's, there are no standards for, um, you know, how does content get put out there? If, if you write for, let's say, a major publication, how there are editors and other people that are going to say, wait a minute, no, somebody has to do the fact checking. Uh, there's a process. But anyone can put out anything, no matter how absurd or incendiary. And the example that I go to is um, the person who read and acted on the belief that there was a pizza parlor that was doing child trafficking. Uh, with which uh, Hillary Clinton was involved. A, there was no basement in this pizza parlor. I mean, the simplest kind of fact-checking would have resolved this issue, but how incendiary these things can be, and anyone can say anything about anything at any time uh, w without any sense of uh, what what are our rules as as a community, as a collective, about fact and truthfulness? What do you think? That, that actually, the, the, the Soviets have developed this into a science. They call it political technology. And the political technology is to, is to develop disinformation that creates chaos in your political rivals. And we're being subjected to that right now, the political yeah. technology of creating false different disinformation. We've seen a lot of that with the, with the hurricane, apparently, where all these stories are being circulated about the failure of the government to respond and so on. You know, what I thought about, Deb, when you mentioned that was, what do you think Jung would say? Remember when Jung wrote about unidentified flying objects and he started mm -hmm. talking about it in terms of maybe this is an expression of the collective unconscious projecting a self-image out into space. What do you think Jung would say about the collective unconscious and political technology and the disinformation and social media creating alternative facts and stories? What do you think Jung would have done with that? <laughs> wow. Uh, there is a very big question. Uh, I don't know if this is what Jung would say, um, since so far I've been unable to channel him. Um, <laughs> but uh, what I think about is um, the theme of how fragmented uh, we've become, that we, we're fragmented, the, the channel gets narrower and narrower like a funnel, where once we lived in tribal groups, physically interacting with one another. 
uh, and we've gone from that kind of cohesive, uh, communal, cultural, daily functioning, collective norm to something where it's just me and my phone. And we're lonely, and we're cut off from one another and cut off from the natural environment in such um, substantive ways, but we don't think about it as we go off every day you know, to work in an office or at home uh, with technology. And, and that that is not a substitute for the collective. And then I think the archetypes start to run wild because we don't have any cohesive, established um, ways to contain things that communities used to contain and religious uh, structures and observances used to contain. We're reliant on ourselves. Uh, and what, as you said, those autonomous complexes that rise up in us is, yes, I believe in that. That must be true. I know that. Oh my gosh. We're very cut off from ourselves, from one another, and from collective uh, collective currents, norms, uh, connections. We are a disconnected society. Tom, I think I want to take a crack at that question about, you know, what would Jung do? <laughs> Um, WWJD. Um, <laughs> and so we do know that Jung was incredibly distraught by what had happened in Germany in World War II. It was a horrifying thing that he had to live and survive in the midst of and put a great amount of energy into trying to figure out how to describe what the hell happened there. And so Jung started talking about the idea of a psychic infection, that the collective psyche of the Germans was a real thing, that it functioned as if it was a single entity, that under stress, large groups of people can lose levels of awareness, that the ego on a collective level drops down and down and closer to an instinctive level. It's almost like a mass hypnosis, but in a mild way. And that once consciousness is reduced, then if the leader has a sense of, let's say, an archetypal dominant that's simmering under the surface, a leader might give voice or embody a certain archetypal potential, which then will draw the group into a singular set of acting, feeling, and Thinking. This can also be manipulated consciously. Joseph Goebbels was studying Bernays' advertising, mass advertising uh, work, which was taken from Freud. And, and so when people are below the threshold of even their normal ego state, they're very, very influenced, influenceable. So as far as I know, Jung didn't really believe that a collective solution could address a collective problem. And that really, it was up to each individual to fight their way back up to a conscious and alert life. Perhaps this theme is, is even rising up with the incredible popularity of mindfulness, which seems to show up everywhere I turn. Mindfulness seems to show up in every therapeutic practice. It's showing up. Every hospital has mindfulness programs. This idea of under stress, can we become more mindful and self-questioning, self-regulating? And beyond that, of course, Jung believed that there is an internal authority, the self, which actually can guide us much more credibly than our telephone or the uh, flyer we saw posted someplace or now our cell phones. So 
I mean, that was, I, that's my sense of what Jung's solution was in a nutshell. But he wasn't aware of the influence of social media. And so there, there may be interventions that, like a podcast, that is a collective thing that might be helpful in a way that Jung couldn't imagine. Yeah. Uh, that, that would be exactly <laughs> where, where I would go, Joseph, which is that the cultural complex that was determinant of, of Jung's time and perhaps it, it, as an individual was the notion of the individual who differentiated out or separated from the mind-numbing collective. So there was a tremendous emphasis on each individual needing to and having to find their own way. And there was a the, the whole notion of individuation, which we love and embrace, comes out of that tremendous emphasis on it needing to be an individual solution to a collective problem. I don't think that's adequate for our times today. I actually think we need to begin to think about collective solutions for collective problems in which, like, for instance, maybe mindfulness would be an example, which as collaborative groups and collaborative individuals, they didn't use the word collaboration a lot in the 1950s. I don't think the word existed in the 1950s. <laughs> you hear collaboration all the time. And I know with my kids and even my grandkids, there's a whole different ethic developing about working together in a way that is not so individualistic as our generation's experience. And I do think something of the solution to these cultural complexes probably lies with collectives, groups of people organizing and learning how to think together and share in a new way. So I, I, don't, I don't turn to Jung's individual solution in the way that might have been appropriate in the 1950s. But, but there's such a difference between conscious cooperation and conscious collaboration versus unconscious, fear-based um, grouping together to survive and then looking to somebody else to interpret our experience. So yes, there is a collective creative spirit in these groups, but hopefully, as you were saying, people are as wide awake as they can be when that's happening. Yeah. So how do we um, relate all of this uh, theoretical wisdom concepts and the rest, how do we relate it to today's political situation here in the U.S.? Um, we have a highly fraught and fought election coming up. Well, uh, first of all, I'm not sure if I have the answer. Uh, in fact, I don't think I do have the answer. I have ideas. Uh, and I do think that the cultural complex notion is one way of helping us sort of parse out some of these issues. Because when you take, when you say polarization, it, it encompasses everything. We all know what it's like. We all feel it. Most of us are probably part of one polarized group or another. So we certainly know what it's like to feel polarized. We know what it's like to be deeply suspicious of the rival group, whether we're Republicans or Democrats. We certainly know the living reality of polarization. I think one way that the notion of cultural complexes can be helpful is if we start to break it down into individual pieces. What is the cultural complex surrounding immigration? What is the cultural complex surrounding misogyny? What is the cultural complex surrounding the nature and experience of the truth? What is the cultural complex around consumerism? What's the cultural complex around the fear and hatred of others? So I do think that if you, if you begin to use the concept and then try and take each of these kind of interconnected issues, which all get glommed together, they all get glommed together, and try and say, how, does, how is the cultural complex affecting my thoughts about immigration? How is the cultural complex affecting my cultural complex or the cultural complex about how I think about a, a black Indian woman being president of the United States? How does my cultural complex affect 
an older, white, very powerful, very wealthy man being president of the United States. I think we need to begin to think. And to think, you need to break things down into component pieces that allow us to make room to have positive thoughts and negative thoughts and positive feelings and negative feelings. We need to make room to breathe and to share and to think without reacting automatically with very strong judgmental feelings, which is what most of us do most of the time right now in our current political environment. And the media contributes enormously to that. They're oh. feeding this, this horse race mentality in which it's every moment. What do what old, what old uh, 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 Iranian women think in Western Pennsylvania? And, and, and you, you, get this, you get so down in the weeds about what's going on that you can't think about anything because it's all broken down into pieces that are too small to digest. So there's something about trying to create an environment in which we can begin to think together and digest and discuss some of these deeply ingrained cultural complexes. They affect how we think about men, how we think about transgender, how we think about women, how we think about the economy, how we think about the middle class, how we think about progress, how we think about Iran, how we think about Israel, how we think about Ukraine. They all get glommed together, and our capacity to think, as Joseph was saying, just gets pulled down into this uh, morass of simplistic judgments. Uh, I, does that help at all? I mean, that maybe that's too general. No, no. But, but let's choose one topic that you want to bring forward. Cat lady could be, but maybe a new one, and and show us as as if you were a school teacher. Show us an idea, and then give us a couple of steps. Like, what would someone do sitting there with their journal and their computer? How would they work this out, or what questions would they be asking themselves about whatever? One topic that's interested you that you think is relevant to this political environment? Well, right now, I think it is being alleged that there are some 13,000 illegal murderers running loose in the United States that are going to come into your house and slit your throat. That's being presented as a fact. There's a specific number given to the number of illegal, not just illegal immigrants, but illegal immigrant murderers. Okay, let's see if we can find out what the number of illegal immigrant murderers is. I mean, we could go try to look it up. We could do some fact checking on our own. We could also say, what purpose does it serve? to think about talking about illegal immigrant murderers running haywire in the United States. What emotion does that cause in us? How do we react to the idea that we have a murderous alien horde that's been unleashed on our civilization? Um, and um, but there was another thought I had about that. So that I, I, you, take, you break down a, 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 something that's presented as a fact illegal immigrant murderers. What does it serve to, to proclaim that? Because, oh, there's a wonderful, in, this, in, the, in the dangerous, not in the dangerous case, in, in uh, the mind of state, there's a fellow named Sidney Solomon who did this most wonderful study of what happens when you subliminally introduce the fear of death into groups of people making decisions. And it turns out he, he subliminally fed a number of judges the idea of some sort of imminent death or de de death. And their sentences increased by six to more months, each one of them. They became much more harsh in their judgments when you introduce the fear of death. What happens when you introduce the fear of death into a population that's about to vote. What are their responses to that? Do they become frightened? And do they become more reactionary or more judgmental? Or do they question that? So I, I would just take, I think what we need to do is we, we could take that. We could take the, 
what's being said about the uh, FEMA's response in in uh, to the to the hurricane and the destruction there. I think you take these statements, which I think are intentionally planted so-called political technology different disinformation to create chaos, fear, and suspicion. I think you need to go in and try to look at each one of those and find out as much info. Do your own fact-checking. Do your own thinking about it. Ask what purpose does it serve to be stirred up in this way? What how do I feel when I'm suddenly confronted with the idea that there's an, uh, an illegal immigrant murderer who's going to come into my kitchen and slit my throat? What does it make me feel like? So I, I think we need to look at these kind of uh, political, they're, they're really, it's forms of psychological terror is really what we're being initiated into. And I think we need to think about it. I don't know if that's helpful. I'm just, this is just off the top of my mind. Um, well, if I can summarize the steps that you gave us, um, I mean, you you are you are the expert we're looking at, and I'm not. <laughs> and this is not my area of specialties, but I'm certainly interested in it. So you've given us a couple of steps. One is to to name the thing that is so deeply disturbing, you know, that that keeps echoing around inside the cave of our mind. Thirteen thousand alien murderers are out for us. So we begin to notice what's, what's gotten gummed up in our own psyche. The next thing, which I love, is become factful. That alone takes the power away from whoever spoke that to your own research. There is, by the way, a wonderful book called Factfulness, 10 Reasons Why We're Wrong About the World, uh, written by a guy named Rosling. And he does these great workshops where he just um, polls the audience, uh, you know, how many, so this is the thing, how many of you believe this, 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 and this, and 90% of the audience has totally erroneous beliefs about these collective things, and then he just introduces facts, and the audience just breaks down because it's so shocking. So facts, that, re, that reality is medicinal. Now, there's also an alienation from information sources because people can become paranoid, and so they they think that whoever is talking to them on their phone is the only factful source, but hopefully people can cross-correlate. So become factful. The next question was, what purpose does it serve the speaker to tell me that? To imagine that there is a psychological, social, political agenda of some kind in a person who is announcing this over and over again. The other step that you said is, what are the feelings that are evoked in you? Now, the two other steps that I think you've inferred at other times is, how might you generalize the theme of the belief, which is where you went to with introducing this idea to, to the judges? And then a step that you did earlier is, what are the similar historic and mythical themes that this might be tickling way, 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 way down? So. Identify the thought you're stuck in, get some facts, what is the purpose of the speaker, what feelings are evoked in you, how might you generalize the theme, does it have a historic and mythical component to it? Would you say that that's a good start? I would say that you can think, and you're a really good thinker, and I really appreciate it because you, you took several things I said and made it crystal clear, and I'm very appreciative of that. And it also reminds me, in a way, it takes us back to what are the defining characteristics of a cultural complex? Can I take the characteristics of a cultural complex and look at the 13,000 murderer piece of information and act? What's the emotion does it evoke? What historical references does it make? Is it an autonomous thought? Does it, does it, does it have a, take on a life of its own inside of me? What kind of images does it conjure up? You ask all the questions that we use to define a cultural complex of the specific thing to see if, in fact, we're, we've, be, we've been seduced into a cultural complex. Uh, I'm going back uh, as a way to image it uh, to your uh, reference to kidneys, Tom, that our kidneys are what uh, allow us to filter 
and that that that's what was was needed in the first amphibians of take all these things and filter it uh through fact checking and naming the feeling that is aroused in you and uh, is there a mythological substrate and what purpose does it serve this person or group to propound uh, you know, something as uh, intentionally manipulative as this. I've just um, have, have put your metaphorical kidneys to work. Yeah, the, the kidney analogy, and thank you for going back to that, is that, that uh, my hypothesis is that our cultural complexes are like our psychological kidney. They're sort of built in there as automatic filtering systems. So we actually need to do some work with our own filtering systems. We need to question our filtering system and say, is my filtering system too influenced by one source of information or another source of information? Can I get different sources or am I just uh, participating in a self-fulfilling uh, memory system in which all of my own ideas are being reinforced because all we all tend to now li- uh, participate in these echo systems or is that what they call it echo uh, where, mm-hmm. where we're echo just chamber. hearing echoings of our own thoughts and feelings and, and we're 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 in these silos of uh, of cultural complexes if you will we're in silos of cultural complexes I'm struck by the intensity with which uh, you're bringing forward these ideas, how meaningful it is to you, Tom. You know, um, I've had a a thought that's been uh, nagging at me, which is not only about how easily we are incited to fearfulness of, you know, like with this idea that there are so many murderers coming around uh, that is instead but also, I'm wondering about what role our basic sense of fairness, and when our sense of fairness is abrogated and we don't think things are fair, um, what that does to us. And I'm reminded of the study that somebody named DeWall did with monkeys, and the, there were monkeys in two cages facing one another. And they had been taught to perform the same task, and each could see what the other was doing. So Dewall came in and asked monkey number one to please press the lever or whatever it was, and the monkey did it, and he was rewarded with a slice of banana. Monkey number two saw this, and then the request was made of monkey number two to please do the same thing, and he did. And he was rewarded with a slice of cucumber and went into an absolute rage uh, because banana is much more desirable than cucumber. I did the same thing he did. How come he got banana? I didn't. Of some sense of injustice, outrage, uh, that things aren't fair and our sense of, of justice, rightness uh, is not being honored. And I think that's big out there. I think there's a tremendous sense of injustice on both sides of the polarized equation so that uh, Trump really talks about the weaponization of the judicial system in an unfair way to persecute him in terms of the various legal things. Yes. And he, he, nobody has weaponized the judicial system more than Donald Trump. He's had over 5,000 different suits I mean, he's the master of weaponizing the judicial system, but he is quite successfully arguing that the judicial system has been unfairly weaponized against him around the issue of January 6th and so on. So both sides are playing the unfairness injustice card. That's interesting. Unfortunately. So there, so there, in some sense, our whole idea about what is fair and what's justice is also a cultural complex. It's, it, we're being made to feel it's a cultural complex. I, I think we used to feel that notions of justice and fairness were relatively objective. I, I, think, we, I think we tended to believe in that. Uh, I certainly did, uh, at least relatively. But now, er, 
you know, the, the Supreme Court's rulings. There's tremendous suspicion of the Supreme Court. There's a, a tremendous loss in, of faith in the judicial system on both sides. And that's what's so scary about right now is that our, all of our, the institutions in which we had some degree of trust is being undermined, I think, by this so-called political technology in which you spread stories to undermine the faith in, in the voting system, in the judicial system, in how FEMA money is being spent and whether it's being used on immigrants and so on. So our, our faith in terms of the equal, fair distribution of justice and money and everything is being undermined. And that's so corrosive to our sense of being a democratic society. So these cultural complexes are right in our face in terms of corroding our beliefs in what has been essential for our democracy for a couple of hundred years. And both sides will now argue that the democracy, as they understand it, is being corroded by the other side, which further undermines. It's a very uh, negative cycle. Yeah. I think someone we can turn to to unpack more of that one day is um, Yuval Harari, who's written a book called Nexus, A Brief History of Information Networks from the Stone Age to AI. And he's very much tracking just that piece of what is information, how information is at the center of culture building, and particularly the bureaucracies that allow cultures to do the things they do, and how the manipulation of information systems and perhaps in the future, the manipulation of those systems by artificial intelligence is remarkably powerful and will be remarkably impactful. It's, uh, he's right there with you. He's not talking about archetypes, but he is talking about our vulnerability to information. We need it. We can't validate every single thing we hear. We don't have time. But people are being tricked into thinking they have to. Well, someone said, I need to take a vaccine. Well, I'm not going to believe it because you said so, but you're also not going to become a research scientist who's working at the Pasteur Institute to be able to evaluate that. So people are taking upon themselves all kinds of decisions without possibly being able to self-validate. And yet, this alienation from information systems alienates us from the culture itself in a way that makes us frightened and makes us vulnerable to being manipulated by the collective. And by the cultural complexes that are most uh, effective at moving people emotionally and frightening people and getting them upset so that the cultural complex comes in as part of the manipulative system of undermining faith in our sources of information. So we no longer have information or facts. We have feelings, we have memes, and we have slogans. Right. And that's something. And in a way, it goes back to what we talked about earlier, you're on your own. It's between you and your phone. Uh, because we have... Uh, Trust has been eroded in our systems, our systems of governance, uh, judiciary, what's fair, what's not fair. So we don't have the kind of uh, assumed uh, values and, and beliefs uh, that we at one point uh, did, did have, even if those beliefs were erroneous. Uh, they held us together in a more cohesive way. And we used to have enormous punishments for people that lied. I mean, ferocious ancient punishments for slander and lying because there was an instinctive understanding of how remarkably damaging it is to, to knowingly spread false information. That's right. And now it's just it's the art of, art of the day is how to lie effectively. Uh, I like what you, you keep going back to being alone with your phone, Deb. I like that a lot because it, it, it implies sort of a, such a personal, intimate, private uh, communication. And in fact, it's just you and 10 million other people tuning into exactly the same thing. It's, 
There's nothing private about it, but it gives the illusion of your own special communication. That's what's so seductive about it. And your own autonomy. Yeah. Uh, that, you know, I can do this. I can do this on my own with my phone, and I'm all I need. Um, and I read what I read, and I decide what I decide, and that's, and that's enough. The other thing I want to swing back to, Deb, because you had touched on this, and then we, we moved on. This was quite a, a ways back. Um, is that you were talking about kind of that mythic, and I think you even might have used the word religious, but but many people clearly feel an almost religious devotion to their political beliefs, and that religion and politics is getting rewound together, which is a kind of a, a manipulative agenda by certain figures. But also, there is something, again, at that cultural level around a religious devotion to a political belief. And so I'm wondering if that's an area that you've been circling around, that level that the religious instinct has somehow invaded politics. Oh, I think you've uh, actually just said it really well, uh, that, um, you know, for Jung, there were five major instincts. I mean, think about that. There are only five of them, you know, and, you know, sort of hunger and our need for physical activity. Those are pretty basic. But one of them, according to Jung, out of only five, was the religious instinct. Of what we need to be related to something greater, need to be related to meaning, to purpose, to the infinite. And I think there is very much a tendency today in the States to put that religious instinct into service around politics and country nationhood, that I believe in, you know, whatever uh, those beliefs are about the autonomy and the sanctity and uh, the divine mission of the United States of America. And we are going to go back to being, you know, a, a Christian and patriotic nation where we all play by those rules. Now, that's my quick gloss on it, which you know, obviously may reveal some bias on my part, but for the purpose of illustrating where the religious instinct can go. I, I agree with that a thousand percent. Uh, I, I recently wrote a little substack, and I'll, I'll forward it to you all. Mm. Uh, it's, it's called The Gods and Goddesses in the 2024 <laughs> Presidential Election. That's because I, I think within a week... We had a god and a goddess created almost spontaneously in front of our faces. We had a, a, an almost assassinated president who got reborn as a, as a heroic Iwo Jima Christ figure. And within another 10 days or so, Kamala Harris emerged at the, as this Indian goddess of, of sort of Durga, who's telling the truth and slicing right through to something essential about the core nature of things. And it goes back to an idea that Jane Harrison picked up from Emile Durkheim about the origin of divinity in early Greek religion. The origin of divinity in this model is collective emotion. When collective emotion is activated strongly enough, it tends to form the image of a divinity. That obviously that's not the only way we have a spiritual or or uh, but it's, there is, gods and goddesses get born out of collective emotion being projected onto a group or an individual, and we're right in the throes of that right now on both sides of the equation. Uh, and, uh, and they're different, they're very different gods and goddesses that are being born, that got born within a one week. In one week, these two god, a god and goddess got born literally because of the intensity of the collective emotion that got aroused around really the spiritual quality that they evoke in their followers. Uh, I totally agree with that. Yeah, it's, uh, that's a wonderful way to, to think about uh, Trump and Harris as images of archetypal uh, gods, goddesses, of 
that tap root goes way, way down. That tap root, that's right. And and you know, if we had the whole Greek pantheon, you know, we have the god of war and we have Aphrodite and uh the list goes on and on. But here we have this polarization from a mythological standpoint uh between this god and this goddess. And which one appeals? Which one uh, taps into that sub subconscious, unconscious place in us that says, "Yes, that that's right. That's the truth. That's where I want to go," without realizing that um, the differences between people and archetypal images and emotions. Excellent. Very well said. <laughs> okay. Really, I mean, it's just perfect. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, Tom, let's take a second, a little breath. We've covered such a wonderful terrain of ideas, and hopefully we've circumambulated this very um, subtle idea of the cultural complex. It's not subtle at all because it's powerful, but it's subtle because it's atmospheric. You know, fish were the last to discover water. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah, it's the so, environment we swim in. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's that, that's always a tricky thing. But if we take a moment, and if you would, to just think, is there is there anything that you wish had been brought up but has not yet? I think the hardest thing to know when you're living in a time like we are is what cultural complexes are we caught in individually? Are our perceptions objective or are we simply swimming in a cultural complex and we're as as gripped by it as those that we on the other side, we fear are in the grips of a terrible cultural complex. I think the hardest thing when you're living through times like these is to know who, where is the cultural complex? And uh, that's, why, that's why Wotan in 1936, Jung's Wotan, where he was talking about the, this god of, of wrath and destruction and fire that was seizing the German psyche, he, he describes it in such vivid, elaborate language that Jewish people thought he was actually advocating that. I don't think he was, but any time you get close to the language of these archetypal forces moving in cultural complexes, it's very hard to know what objective ground you can stand on. That's our challenge. And, and and I don't think, you know, in the name of fairness, like in the media, they say, well, we'll give Harris this amount of time, we'll give Trump this amount of time, and some really screwy journalistic idea of fairness, which is just, it doesn't work. And so the, the challenge for us is to find objective bearings in the midst of such potent cultural complexes. I don't have the answer to that. I think that I'm being objective about what I believe, but I'm sure that that from the other from the Trumpian side, I would be accused of having a, the Trumpian derangement syndrome that I'm totally in the grips of a crazy complex. And so I think the biggest challenge is to identify our own complexes and find some ground of of uh, security in knowing that we we have our feet on the ground. So that's more of a question than an answer. Yeah. Well, it, speak, it speaks to what, what's important. It speaks to what you want to make sure that people are taking away from this conversation. It speaks to your passion about the topic and what's at stake and what's necessary. Thank you. That's exactly right. I do. I am passionate. That's why I, I, when you step back and 
and think so clearly, it's a great relief to me because I feel so caught up in my own passion. <laughs> well, it gives you potency when you're communicating it. I, I wonder, too, if something that might um, help us, something I've become somewhat newly aware of or another facet of is um, that we love our, most of us love our country. We care about our polity and, and each other. And uh, that can we get in touch with our compassion and just our sadness and distress about how polarized we've become? And uh, get get in touch with some of those feelings in ourselves of isn't this a difficult place to be? And that's a place we're all in together. Is our awareness of what a hard place we're in as a country? And I think most people, you know. Um, Maybe not the people that are putting out all stuff, all kinds of stuff on social media or actively manipulating, but most people are coming from a place of caring, uh, wanting the best, wanting things to be cohesive and, and fair and responsibly administered. Uh, and, and so somehow there's a grieving underneath all this of uh, what's happened to us. And we get pulled into a political stance that's left or right in, instead of being able to stay with uh, what is happening here, what's happening to us. So to be self-reflective, to, to think to ourselves, and self-reflection is one of Jung's uh, five instincts. It's something every human being has an innate capacity to reflect upon things, to talk to themselves, not their phone, about various things. And, and I would like to make a case in addition to, uh, for wisdom, that uh, since the ancient Greek philosophers, uh, ancient Chinese philosophers, one of the places people go to in times of suffering and confusion is seeking wisdom, which is something of a path of discipline. And there is wisdom out there. So we've mentioned a couple of books. Books are still valid. Even if you <laughs> listen to the audio version, they're still valid. Cultural Complexes and the Soul of America. And that's Tom, one of Tom Singer's books. Mind of State. Conversations on the Psychological Conflicts Stirring U.S. Politics and Society, another book Tom's involved with, The Righteous Mind yes. by Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T, Factfulness by Hans Rosling, and Nexus, A Brief History of Information by Harari. Got to tell you what, if this is important to you, armed with those five books, you would read those five books and you'd walk away with a certain kind of clarity that, that grants us some amount of resilience to the seduction of collapsing into a collective attitude. No book's going to liberate us totally, but clear thinking is an enormous tool to stand against the theater of these collective complexes, and has ever been so. I, and I think that's really great, Joseph. And I would, in addition to clear thinking and sources that can help us do that, I would also say um, ref reflection on what we are feeling. When we get activated and they, whoever they happen to be, uh, become bad or, you know, we're outraged and so on, just notice what's going on. I'm becoming polarized. And I'm particularly become suspicious. Right. And <laughs> I'm in a righteous, uh, right, wrong, good, bad 
kind of mind frame. So when I get really activated, and, and there's, I can be, we all can be, and then we can step back and reflect on that, like, wow, wow, that was, I was really heated about that. And, and you're on that, Deb. At any time we have a disproportionate emotional reaction, which often happens in hindsight, there should be just a little alarm going off in our circuits, like, I probably need to really re- reflect upon this, think about it, because it doesn't make sense that I was suddenly shouting in the restaurant because somebody <laughs> said this or that sentence, or I, I don't want to speak to my child again because they're voting for a different candidate. That's a disproportionate response, and that should tell us I'm caught in something. Yeah, that's the really useful distinction that. Jung makes between affect or emotion and feeling. Uh, Jung Jung called feeling a rational function, uh, and he differentiated it from emotion or affect because for Jung, feeling was was a a kind of refined capacity that was based on a, a reflection over time. So if you make the distinction between feeling and affect or emotion, that's a helpful way of distinguishing between well, when am I saying sort of has has sort of the right amount of feeling, if you will, as opposed to too highly charged? Uh, that that might be a way of distinguishing. Here here's the thing that I here's my guide mm-hmm. uh, in terms of uh, in terms of what you're both introducing. It comes from Olga Tokachuk, who wrote uh, "Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead." She's a Nobel Prize winning uh, Eastern European author, and she writes, it's a good thing that God, if he exists, and even if he doesn't, gives us a place where we can think in peace. Perhaps that's the whole point of prayer, to think to yourself in peace, to want nothing, to ask for nothing. That's different than the cell phone, I think. It's different than the cell phone. That sounds like a beautiful place for us to pause, not stop the conversation, but just put a bookmark in it because there's much more to be said about all of this. Thank you so much, Tom. That was a beautiful way to come to a pause. Thank you. I I love talking to both of you. You're very gifted, and I really appreciate it. Oh, my goodness. And and back at you, thank you very much for coming on and having a conversation about the state of affairs in this world, or as you say, the mind of state. So thank you. Our dreamer today is a 59-year-old male who has a creative profession. And here's his dream. I am an aide to some kind of Al Gore figure who is now president of the United States. I'm dressed in a business suit and tie, and I meet informally with other staff members in the West Wing of the White House. My job involves some aspect of economics combined with a responsibility over Gore's ground transportation. Gore, the staff members, and I all ascend a circular stairway to a higher floor in the building where we are to meet the Treasury Secretary. I am there to secure a supply of gold bars that we are always to keep in the trunk of President Gore's limousine in the event of a major crisis that would require immediate access to hard money for negotiation. I secure the gold in the trunk of the vehicle, and we depart for an unidentified location. We drive through a tropical urban capital like Taipei or New Delhi. The canopy of lush green trees have an artificial feeling like Adventureland at Disneyland. Somewhere along the way, the vehicle turns into a convertible, like the one in which President Kennedy rode when he was killed in Dallas. I observe that Gore and staff have disappeared, and now my mother and father are in the front seat of the vehicle and my mother is driving. Suddenly, 
we learn there is a wild tiger on the loose, one that is much larger than a tiger in the real world. I'm sitting in the back seat, and from the behind, the limousine, the tiger leaps over the trunk at me with its jaws wide open. The tiger is so large that it is able to bite both my father and mother at the same time. Both are mauled badly, my father worse. Throughout the tiger incident, I'm safe in the back seat, seemingly invisible or otherwise unharmed by the tiger. Watching the whole attack, I'm unable to intervene. My mother manages to stop the car and crawl away, and she uses a movable fence nearby to quickly make a barricade. My father is in bad shape, but still alive, and she somehow pulls him to safety behind the fence. In the back seat with me, there is a blonde girl or young woman, not my wife or daughter, who is unharmed also. And we quickly move behind the fence and into the nearby shop doorway. We shut the door for protection. And then I wake from the dream. For significant context, the dreamer adds, a therapist has been helping me with lots of transitions in the last two years. My mother died after a long bout with Alzheimer's. I recently ended a difficult 20-year business partnership with a married couple. My only child has been in college during COVID, and I am turning 60 soon. The main feelings in the dream were formality, urgency, important duty. He had a sense of equanimity, and nothing in the dream evoked fear or anxiety, not even the tiger attack. Um, and he also adds, with my former business partners, I worked closely with Al Gore on a project about climate change. The day before my dream, I had a major breakthrough in a therapy session and was able to understand how my parents, now both deceased, each repressed aspects of my authentic childhood self. Really important stuff. Hmm. So it's a very interesting, fulsome dream. And I love dreams that have such a wonderful mm. dramatic arc. There's a setting, there's uh -huh. mounting action, there's a denouement. It's a wonderful kind of, it follows the Greek Aristotelian play process. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And one, and one of the things that tells us is um, he received a really complete communication from the self. There's something gratifying about it tying up at the end. Um, I'm thinking about this dream essentially as taking place in two acts. This is a two-act play, uh, and the, the first act has to do with um, being an aide to Al Gore, for whom he once actually did work. Uh, it, and it, it feels very intellectual, very rational, very functional. Very, you know, we're not having a lot of feelings here. Um, he's got responsibility, he says, over Gore's ground transportation. They, they go up to a higher floor, so we're elevating, to meet the Treasury Secretary. So something about economics and money and so on. And this um, whole image of having gold bars with you or with Al Gore or the Al Gore part of the dreamer at all times. Uh, uh, and I'm thinking about that, that uh, it's important to be prepared in this kind of transactional, monetary, gold kind of way. Um, and it feels nice they're in a tropical, lush environment. But then... The car turns into a convertible like the one in which President Kennedy rode when he was uh, killed in Dallas. Very ominous. So we're, we're doing our job. Everything is okay. He's responsible. There is order. And then there's this hint about being in a convertible 
uh, and being vulnerable, visible, vulnerable. And then it turns to his parents. Scene two. No more gore. Now it's the parental imagos who are present in the car. And so that can suggest sometimes that what he's, um, what was the presidential attitude inside of him, which in alchemy can be associated with the king. And in some of the alchemical images, the old king will dissolve or pass away, and then a new king will arise and be blessed. And that's often interpreted as the predominant attitude towards life has run its course, and then a new attitude is perhaps emerging. So I think we're getting one perhaps meta-communication that the guiding attitude in the psyche, which at first seems rather kingly, is probably being driven by the parents. Aha. Yeah. And that the king attitude and the whole first part of the dream is very ego-oriented. Of Everybody's in charge, things are orderly, take charge of ground transportation, make sure you have that gold bar, the treasury secretary, very governmental and um, matter-of-fact. And that now this gives way, just as you were saying, Joseph, to the parental attitude of, of this orderly, professional, unemotional, ego-oriented attitude gives way to something else. And um, I'm interested in the fact that in the comments he says he just felt a sense of equanimity and nothing in the dream evoked fear or anxiety, not even the tigers. But part two of the dream um, is, oh my God, there's a wild tiger on the loose. And and it's huge. Now this the tiger leaps over the trunk of the car, uh, and and our dream ego, with its jaws wide open, and attacks both of his parents. Uh, and this is a scene that our dream ego observes with ep- equanimity. So that might be a first place to say, hmm, um, most of the time if there were a wild tiger on the loose and it was that big, we, we might feel surprise, alarm, fear, a host of things. Uh, but our dream ego does not. The, the parents get to crawl, crawl away. And now we learn that there's a blonde girl or a young woman who's not a family member or his partner, his wife, she is unharmed and they move behind the fence into a nearby shop doorway. Hmm. Our dream ego has a girlfriend. Right, an anima figure, perhaps. So um, there's so many, if we take a naturalistic lens to this, it would seem unusual to be so um, unemotional. I would imagine if we were to see a film clip of this and somebody in the back seat expressed no emotion, we would think they were dissociated, which actually is a way where the self-saving part of our psyche will put our emotions to sleep when we are in a really terrible circumstance so that we can not collapse under the stress of it. So that's it's it's one interesting idea, but I'd like to just um, say that um, it is possible because he's in therapy that he is prepared to see the parental complexes he's he gobbled up by certain forces in the unconscious that it's kind of could be time for living under the rules of the inner parents. Yes. To kind of be weakened and deposed. And I think that is being prepared for in the first half of the dream. I'll just point out a few things. 
that you are to secure a supply of gold. In alchemy, gold is synonymous with wisdom. So we're getting gold in the event of a major crisis. And a crisis happens in the second half of the dream. So what we could also say is, you've been collecting a kind of wisdom about the psyche, about yourself in therapy, perhaps philosophically, because a major change is kind of brewing. And to your comment, Deb, about the first half being perhaps an ego orientation, which is fine, is we begin to get the sense of um, the trees have an artificial feeling, which I think was hinting at what you were saying, that there's something, there's something that's a little not quite fulsome enough in the collection of wisdom in preparation for the crisis. But wisdom often does give us an enormous amount of objectivity. Like, for instance, if he knows about the parental complexes, seeing this as symbolic could allow him to stay pretty relaxed. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm really sort of adding here, building on what you've said, of that he has acquired a hidden supply of gold, the eternal, the thing of highest value, and it's been stored away in a trunk. And um, they're, you're headed for an unidentified location. Psyche's going somewhere, but where? Well, we don't know, but somewhere. A- and in the first scene, the environment is artificial. It's like Adventureland at Disneyland. It's not a, it's not a real natural environment. But nevertheless, there's the potential that the gold represents. And uh, then in part two, I think we, as you say, that's where the crisis happens with uh, this tiger and the parental complexes are attacked and crawl off somewhere behind a fence. (laughs) Presumably they survive, but they're out of here. And And the tiger part of our dreamer Uh, has done something aggressive in order to then have the space for the relationship with this young woman, a blonde girl or young woman, not my wife or daughter, is also unharmed. So we have this secret liaison of romance that parental complexes can have lots of rules and regs about who we may be close to, who we may be in love with, who we may have sexual liaison with. And now something else has happened, imaged as a girlfriend, but an inner part of the self, which is the perfect time in life, there are dreamers almost 60, for inner life to come to the fore of something young, blonde, beautiful, tinged with sexuality, all this is a way of representing vitality, inner vitality, that the parental complexes um, would presumably interfere with, because after all, they're in the front seat, and our dream ego, right, they're driving the car um, until the tiger takes them away and gives our dream ego and his anima autonomy. Beautiful. Returning to alchemy, there is a famous image of the green lion swallowing the golden oh, that's, sun. That's right. It's, it's a wonderful right? image. And so we, here we have a, a tiger trying to gobble up the parents. But in alchemy or in psychological interpretation of alchemy, it's thought that at some point in our lives, because we've spent a lot of time pressing our instincts down in service to our civilized lives, that the instincts take a big jump up and they kind of gobble up the ego. And what that means is we're subject to very intense instinctive feelings, which as you were pointing to earlier, Deb, is vitalizing, although it can be disruptive. 
one of the instincts here is um, there's a lot of anger and aggression towards the parents, which of course we feel at least as infants we do. We may have oh my put goodness. that aside in our civilized adults, but as you know, look at a baby, like a four year old getting <laughs> mad at their parents. If they had a machete, the parents would be in trouble. <laughs> like there's a level of rage that toddlers can feel towards their parents that is stunning. And then the final scene, when the parental attitudes have been really weakened, because we're not supposed to live out our parents' lives. We've got our own stuff. Just as you said, there's the dream ego. And what I would say is the blonde girl reminds me of Venus, who is often described as the golden goddess, ever youthful, ever beautiful, ever perfect. And Venus which is connected to the story of Helen of Troy because she sparks uh, the Trojan War, has to do with the rebirth of desire. So part of that vitalization at 60 is to discover that there is a life of desire, things that you desire. Here in the you know, second half or perhaps the last third of your life, the, it's not over. Mm-hmm. And desire and erotic feeling and aggression, you know, are all vitalizing things. Um, somehow we, most of us absorb some idea that aggression is really very bad. And, you know, nice people, uh, polite people don't do that. Um, I would point to how many millions of people watch football games, professional and college football, <laughs> because it serves as an outlet for our uh, aggressive impulses, and we can experience them uh, vicariously. Uh, and the other thing I would point to in the dream is that it's a tiger. It's it's. It's not any other kind of creature. It's a tiger. And a tiger, I would say, is the most unbelievably gorgeous creature we could possibly think of with that amazing coloration, giant paws. Um, It's invulnerable. It doesn't have any natural predators except probably man, but not in the jungle. A tiger lives the way it wants to live and is beautiful and aggressive. When necessary. They're not randomly aggressive like most animals. They're actually just hunters. And when they're hungry, they eat prey. And sometimes these big cats won't eat for weeks afterwards because they don't need to. They enjoy life uh, lying around out there in the jungle. Um, you're absolutely right. They have a very, a very good life. And when it's time for lunch, they go find an antelope somewhere. Exactly. So, <laughs> uh, so it, this is a dream that I think opens uh, our, our dreamer, in my imagination, um, into a new phase of autonomy freedom, uh, connection with the part of himself that we call the anima. And um, and it's no wonder that this dream uh, occurred, was sent by our dream maker, his dream maker, um, right after a major breakthrough in therapy. It's, it's a, actually a very encouraging dream. There's also a... Um... A wonderful, I would love to look at the beginning and the end of the dream. So I am an aide to some kind of a presidential figure. So the dreaming goes just in service to some other parental, presidential, cultural idea. And in the end, he and this lovely feminine soul are in a doorway. And remember, doorways are liminal transitional spaces you're going from one place to another and you shut the door for protection and at first we may think oh it's protection from the tiger but actually i think it's protection from the parental complexes 
yeah. that you and your soul get to start a private conversation in a place where you're not being excessively influenced by all of the ideas that we can be colonized by. Thanks for listening. To submit a dream, suggest an episode topic, or join our mailing list, visit our website, thisunionlife.com. If you enjoyed this episode, give us five stars and a good review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and make sure to click the notification bell to be alerted whenever we upload new videos. And keep up with all things TJL by following us on Instagram, Facebook, X, and TikTok.